This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. I am so excited about today's guest. Not only does she have an incredible story, but she is an incredible friend, Mary Catherine Ham. I'll give you a little bit of background. Mary Catherine is a CNN political com commentator and the author of the book, End a Discussion, which she wrote with Guy Benson. She's a graduate of the University of Georgia, which if you know anything about her, you know that she is a proud Georgia fan and the mother of two who resides in Virginia with her husband, Steve. Mary Catherine, welcome to The Resilient Life. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, man. And I think I should have probably added, she's also a member of the board of directors for the Travis Mannion Foundation. It's true. It's on my CV, Ryan. Yes, it's on there. That should be in that should have been in the bio. How did I not how did I not put that in? So, well, Mary Catherine, thank you so much for being on the Resilient Life. You are actually our first female guest, which All right. yeah, what girl power. I was like, we need to get some strong females on this show. And of course, um couldn't think of anybody better to kick it off with than you. Um, so I was thinking last night, I wanted to start off with how we met. And I was actually sharing with some people on our team how far back we go. And it's kind of crazy. And I started telling them the story of how we first met. And I said, well, you know, our path to friendship and what we do together, it's it came through my brother, Travis. And mm -hmm. um, so Travis was in Iraq and Mary Catherine's boyfriend at the time was <laughs> an embedded journalist with Travis's team. And yes. after Travis was killed, um, it was the first year we ran the Marine Corps Marathon together as a team. We weren't quite the Travis Mannion Foundation yet, but we were just a group of people that wanted to continue doing something, get out there, honor my brother, honor the sacrifices of others. And and I remember you at that first dinner. I remember yep. you at the dinner the night before the marathon. And um, and then you and your boyfriend broke up and um, like all, you know, divorced couples, you know, you got to pick one. And uh, we picked Mary Catherine because- I, They couldn't get rid of me. Yes. They could not get rid of me. <laughs> and you, uh, no. I did when I when I I knew about Travis before he died, but I always say he is the person I know best who I never met um, because I only knew about him. Um, and then he passed away. And but from that second on, I've been hanging around the Mannion family. So I I realized that the story of your dad running in honor of Travis that year because they were supposed to run the Marine Corps Marathon together. I just thought that was such a beautiful story, and so I wanted to write that. And so I ended up sort of being a friend slash reporter and then a friend from that from that point on because uh, I always tell people if you get involved with this group you're probably not going to avoid running marathons and uh, you're not going to want to leave even though they're making you run marathons so here I am there, that's true and so <laughs> that was 2007 seven mm -hmm. and then did you run the marathon the next year when was the first time I, you ran the marathon with us i ran it in 2008 okay so the next year which was a mistake because it was an election year and i work in politics so i was young and silly and i got away with not training for that one and i made it through at a run walk pace but i would not recommend that as a training regimen yes well <laughs> I, I took that year off because i ran in 2007 and then i actually said i would never run a marathon again and everybody yes. told me once you run a marathon you get the bug you cross that finish line and it's like having a baby you forget about the pain and all you want to do is do it again and i didn't forget about the pain for like 10 years 
And so yeah. it took me a really long time to run another marathon. But, um, but yeah, yeah it, it got me too. I don't know how it tricked me, but I've done what four now. Yeah. Three or four. Yeah. Ooh. You've been out there. <laughs> so, so fast forward, you become connected with our organization. Um, you're really, were a part of the Travis Manning foundation from day one, um, from the inception of us being a small little family memorial fund to really becoming a, a large veteran serving organization that worked with veterans across the country. And you've been there through that evolution. And for those that don't know about the Travis Manion Foundation, we are a, a veteran serving organization that works with veterans, but also works with families of fallen service members. You know, after my brother was killed in Iraq, we wanted to make sure that we were offering opportunities to empower those families that were left behind to make sure that we were giving them opportunities to say, hey, your loved one is no longer here, but your service to this country and your communities is still needed. And I want to talk about the role that that played in your life, because certainly when you joined our organization, you joined because you saw a spirited group of people that I think were doing some cool stuff. But beyond that, you didn't really have any connection to what we were doing other than the idea. I know you had family that served in the military, right. but you know, there wasn't this connection of, you know, I get what these, I get what these people have experienced. No, I, I think it, it was, it was really just that I thought, oh, this is such a powerful story of a father running for his son and sort of with his son. And I remember when I covered that um, in 2007, one of the things that was uh, really sort of poetic about it is that your dad ran with both of the chips on his shoes because he got Travis, it still makes me choke up a little bit. He got Travis's chip. Um, and so they both really in the results crossed the finish line. I just thought this was such a, a beautiful way to grieve and to move forward. And then I've watched since then um, and I've been there the whole time and it's still a bit mind blowing to watch something that was such a small family thing um, become such a such a large impact on so many people's lives has been amazing to watch. And then it turns out that I needed many of the skills and many of uh, the experiences and sort of uh, walking through grief training that I had uh, knowing you guys for for those years because I was there when when Travis died or near to it and then uh when your mom passed away as well and so i've been sort of in that circle with you guys uh and going through the tough stuff and it turned out i i needed that um i got some training uh because in 2015 uh my husband died unexpectedly a uh, cycling crash and uh it turned out i had this group of friends and near family <laughs> surrounding me who it's never, it's never like you have a solution to it, but if you know how to go through it and you know people who know how to go through it, your path will be easier. And so I was in this situation where I was blessed to have a bunch of people around me, including you, who had some knowledge about how to deal with these things. Yeah, and you know, I was talking with, I was talking with someone yesterday about um, the loss of your husband, Jake. And, you know, I, I also felt like I, why you say you were prepared, um, not prepared, how can you ever be prepared? But yeah. while you kind of, you said right away, you recognize like, oh, I've got other people that have dealt with sudden tragedy, the sudden loss of a loved one. I also remember in that moment, I will never forget. And I think, you know, Jake, um, for those that don't know, Jake was a, an incredible individual who was a, um, worked with uh, the Obama administration at the White House super smart guy. Um, I always loved talking with him. He also ran the Marine Corps marathon with yes, us a bunch of times. And Easier to convince than most of us. Yes. He was. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he was participating in a charity bike ride in DC when unfortunately he was hit by a car. And, mm -hmm. um, and I never, I'll never forget that morning and I didn't hear it from you. I got a call from a mutual friend and they said, oh my gosh, Jake, Jake has been killed. And I think back to that time where had I not dealt with what I had dealt with in my life, I would have said, okay, well, what, what do I do now? I don't know what to do. And, and I think back to friends that had lost 
parents and grandparents and loved ones close to them growing up. And I didn't really know how to act. I didn't know how to respond to that. And, you know, frankly, had I not dealt with the losses that I had dealt with, especially Travis knowing and thinking back to that state of shock that I was in when Travis was killed, um, I probably would have waited to see how I could potentially get a hold of you. And then I would have casually asked, well, let me know if there's anything I can do standing by. I'm here for you. You know, that's kind of, I think, how we're ingrained to respond. And I know now that like that serves literally no purpose. And <laughs> I got the call from our mutual friend and I just stood up and I told my husband that Jake had been killed and... I got in my car, I drove to our Travis Manning Foundation office because I didn't know where you were, I didn't know what state you were in, I didn't know what you had, and I just started throwing clothes into a bag, Travis Manning Foundation gear into a bag. So I'm like, because uh, I remembered back to when Travis was killed, I lived in my dad's sweatshirt and it was a Marine Corps sweatshirt from like 1980. <laughs> and for some reason that sweatshirt brought me comfort and it was like that was my my cloak that I had to have on me at all times even when I went to Dover when my when Travis's casket arrived at Dover I was in a beautiful black dress with a you know 35 year old sweatshirt zipped up over me um and so I got all the stuff and I just started driving and I didn't even know where you were at the time I had no clue if you were at your house and 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 you know through a series of phone calls, found out that you were at, you know, Jake's parents' house. And I showed up there and I just remember saying like, I don't know what you need, but here's some clothes. And you ended up putting on a blue Travis Manion Foundation zip up. And I remember you wearing that for the days that followed. I wore it all the time. Um, I tell people this a lot and just for for context. so, So Jake and I were married for four years. He was 34. Um, when he died. And I think, I think there's also something um, that is a very specific experience about someone dying in their prime like that, um, that you could relate to. Uh, So I think that was important for me to have some of that in my, in my life, Um, because it is so out of the blue, even, even if somebody's in an inherently risky situation, as many, uh, as many who serve are, it still feels just wrong. Uh, And it's a, it's a different kind of mourning process. But I remember you coming. And one of the things that helped, and I've tried to apply this in the future, trying to help uh, since then, trying to help other people, all of my clothes had all these memories attached to them. And I also was afraid to go back to my house. I hadn't been back there yet. And I was afraid to walk in and see things how he left them because he was the last person at the house. I didn't know what that would do. And so I just stayed sheltering in place where I was. So I didn't have a ton of clothes. And then I had these clothes that were like cute and I felt like a human, (laughs) which is something that you're trying to accomplish, uh, at least pretending to be a human in those early days. And um, and that sweatshirt became very important to me. (laughs) And in fact, so important to me that uh, when I was in labor with my child, oh, I should have added that as context. I was seven months pregnant when this happened. Um, So obviously- And you had a two-year-old. With a two-year-old. So, a two-year-old so we and have, seven months pregnant. Yeah, so I'm seven months pregnant. My daughter was two. So everyone, even more than you would worry about someone in this situation, people were, by degrees, <laughs> even more worried about me, um, just staying healthy. That sweatshirt became so important that when I gave birth, I was in labor basically the whole time wearing that sweatshirt. And I was so hot, but I would not take it off. <laughs> Like, I don't know why I just need it on. We're going to wear the tank top and the sweatshirt. We're fine. (laughs) This sweatshirt will stay on. Yes. But yeah, there's, it's so, I try to give people comfy clothes now because there is something that is nice about new things that don't have this old life attached to them that you have to deal with. Now, like some people want something that's different from that. But for me, that was like, oh, I could just sit around and relax and things that I don't have to process emotionally. Well, so yeah, strange and, the things that will work for you. And interestingly enough, the red sweatshirt that I wore after Travis was killed, I was not at my house either. So I yeah. had limited clothes. I was at my parents' house visiting my parents for the day, lived in New Jersey. So I came with nothing. And 
that sweatshirt, I remember going into my parents' bedroom and I opened a drawer. I had never seen that sweatshirt before in my life. It was like in one of those drawers where you're saving stuff you're not, you don't wear. It's right. like the, the t-shirts you love and the sweatshirts you love, but you're never gonna wear them again, but they're there. And maybe one day you'll make a quilt out of them. It was like in one of those drawers. And so <laughs> I had the same connection to that. It was like, okay, this is something different. I'm gonna put it on. I have no memories of anyone being in this. So I right. totally, I totally get that. And, um, you know, I think about one of the things I think about during that time for you is the positive attitude that you took. And it was almost, for me, I'll say it was almost uncomfortable to yeah. witness someone trying to stay so positive because yes. I, you know, I'm like, I know she's hurting. I know that, you know, her life today is different than it was yesterday, that she is going to go through some really tough times. And, but you kept this idea of I'm going to be positive through it all. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was talking to you about it the one time and you said, you know, it's not in my nature not to be positive. It's, it's yeah. just who I am. And so I'm not going to change that because my husband died. Like I'm, I, I need to embrace that even more during this time. And yeah, I, I, and I know that it had, had the potential to make many people uncomfortable because people go, well, is she a, is she actually okay? Uh, and people would ask me that they would say, they would say, is, is this real sort of poking at me? Um, and for the most part, it really was, but it, it was sort of a cognitive behavioral therapy where I was, I was choosing not to go down darker paths. Um, and I was trying actively not to ignore that I needed to feel these feelings, but I did not want to, I felt if I took the wrong turn at some point that I might not come back. <laughs> like yeah. I, if you go too far down these, this dark path, um, what happens to you? So I was, I was trying uh, very hard to practice self-preservation every day. And sometimes that was just eating a handful of peanuts because I needed protein because I was growing a baby and I didn't want to eat. Uh, and sometimes that was thinking and writing. And actually that helped me a lot too. And writing, I think in the first Instagram post where I announced what had happened, I said, this will change us, um, but we can pray that it's in beautiful ways or new ways and, mm -hmm. uh, and that it won't be all tragic all the time. Granted, that is a strange thing for a widow to write, um, or maybe not the the average thing a widow would write a day after this happened, but I wanted, I knew that this was the truth. I was not in denial, and I needed to set myself up to walk a path that looked a certain way. And so I was trying to build some some guardrails for myself, uh, and the the baby herself was a guardrail because I couldn't drink a bunch, I couldn't be super irresponsible. I had to just keep eating handfuls of cashews and moving forward with my life. Um, and I also had a two-year-old who was, who needed me to care for her. Now there were plenty of so many people supporting me who did help her. And in the mornings when I didn't feel like it could take her and get, get her breakfast, it was not a, it was not a situation where she would have been left un, unattended at all. But I felt like that was my saving grace. Those two, those two babies were my saving grace. I had to get up and I had to do the thing. Um, and even when things were dark, because there are plenty of times there were, even though I'm putting, I'm trying to move in this direction, uh, the fact remained that I had to do what I had to do for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I also think it's, it's quite symbolic that, you know, you look back to that 2007, I ran the marathon that year after losing my brother just a few months before. Right. And then that year, that's 2015. Is that 2015? 2015, mm -hmm. you run um, the, well, you're like eight months pregnant at the time. And yeah, I did you, the 10K. You did the 10K and I did that with you. And I mean- So that was a month and a half after- a month and a half. A month after he died? Yes, yeah. it was like half? the following yeah. month. And you're like, all, yeah. all right, I, I can't I can't run the marathon. I'm eight months pregnant, but <laughs> I can do a 10K. And we did the 10K together. And I think about it because I think 
I ran that marathon and then our mutual friend, Amy lost her husband. Mm -hmm. And what did she do? She ran a marathon the following year. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of like this, oh, you, you lost your husband. You lost your brother. Oh, well just run a marathon. I mean, that'll, you know, that's That's the first thing thing that you you do. do. (laughs) That's the first thing you do. Um, but it's interesting that, that we find these things to hold on to. And we find these things that these things that work for us and by passing them on, you know, we can find comfort in that community. Um, and I always think that's, you know, and I, I think it's possible. And I, I really, I literally don't think I've thought this thought before until right now. I think it's possible that some of the, the positive attitude or, or, or hopeful attitude that I had could very well have come from the fact that I saw your family be- build beautiful things coming out of tragedy. I, I knew that that was possible. I had seen it happen and it doesn't change the fact that this is really tragic or as, as I always said in the thick of it, I said, my life is literally horrific right now. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, that's the thought I kept having, but I knew that things could look different because I had seen people walk through that. Right. And I think that was important to me. And now looking back on it now, I'm like, I saw people model that for me. Um, and I tell people now when they get in touch with me, I did not intend to be Googleable as a pregnant widow, but that's, that's what I am. It's, that's in my resume as well. Um, so people will get in touch with me uh, when they are in a similar situation um, or someone who's just lost someone and one of the things I tell them is, I'm sorry that it sounds so cliche, but you actually have to just put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And I think that's part of what running races did for me. The physical part of moving is feeling like your life is moving forward. You're not going to sit in this one dark place forever. It will change. And that's scary because part of losing somebody, as I know you know, is that the further you move from the point in time when they existed, the more worried you get about being okay. Because is being okay wrong? (laughs) Is being okay letting go of the memory? Does being okay mean that you're not honoring them the correct way? And so you're processing all that, but I like to process that while I'm running or while I'm doing something active when I'm physically walking those steps. whether it's just getting up in the morning and going for a walk outside for five minutes or doing a marathon. Yeah. And I, you know, you put it so much better than I ever have, but it is, it, it was just that, like, for me, it was those small steps. And, you know, when you talk about this idea of running a marathon, people are like, Oh, I could, I love people that say to me, I could never run a ma- marathon. And I look at them and they're way more physically fit than I am. <laughs> and I'm like, you have no idea. Anyone can run a marathon, like anyone. I, I truly believe in front of yeah, yeah, it is. It is that one foot in front of the other and committing that every day I'm going to follow that plan. And if I have to put one foot in front of the other for 10 minutes more today, I'm going to do it. But you work mm-hmm. up to it. And, and I always say like the marathon ex- itself is that's the celebration for all the work that you've put in for all right. those days of putting one foot in front of the other. So I totally get that. Um, so you're in this situation and, and I want to kind of dive into, um, I want to dive into where you are today, but one of the things I want to talk about, and I love, you wrote a fantastic article, um, in April and it was not only my favorite article during the pandemic, but just in general (laughs) about parenting. And it's so applicable in so many different ways. But you wrote this article um, in The Atlantic, it's okay to be a different kind of parent during the pandemic. But more than that, it's when something outside outside your control changes in your life, pandemic, loss of your husband, it's what you do with what you can control that really shapes your children. And- You have two incredibly resilient, beautiful, outgoing, spirited children that, um, you know, is a true testament to how you raise them and through all the trials and tribulations that they have gone through in their young little lives. Um, it's amazing to see how well they have flourished. 
Thank and, you. I'm very proud of them. Yes, and you should be. And um, and so I was reading through your article, and, and and I encourage all of you to go and and Google this article in the Atlantic. It's it's so good, and we'll put a link to it in our um on our YouTube page as well. But um, I was I have a couple parts I want to talk to you about, and this is more about your your loss with Jake. Um, you wrote, uh, quoting Joan Didion, life changes fast, life changes in the instant. Joan Didion wrote that in the year of magical thinking, and that was her memoir about losing her husband and daughter. And she wrote, you sit down to dinner and life as you know it ends. And specifically to what's ha- what was happening at that time in April during the pandemic, you know, Mary Catherine wrote, you're probably feeling like you're seated at that table now. The coronavirus is serving up a rare and tragic mix of grief, drastic life changes, and economic stress to a huge swath of the country. And I tried to think about that a little bit because first, it was very poignant and very spot on. And, um, you know, I've gone through every emotion possible um, since the beginning of March. Yes. Um, and we'll also get into where I was the week before the, the world shut down. <laughs> but, um, but I know that there are people around me who have struggled way more than I have. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things you talk about is um, you talk about perspective and you talk about this idea of things that bothered you in 2014 yeah. Didn't bother you in 2015. No. You know, and, and I feel the same way. You know, things that I complained about pre my brother dying were were insignificant after he passed away. And so I've really tried to put this whole idea of what's happening into perspective. Um, yeah. And it's hard to do that without, you know, for me, I feel like I can deal with anything as it comes at me. But... It's also, we've talked about it a little bit offline, this idea of when it starts to affect your kids, right? Yeah. And and how you have to work towards working with your kids in a different way in this, in this new world. And, you know, I want you to talk a little bit about why you wrote this article and, you know, some of the things you've done through the pandemic um, to help move forward with your children and, and creating a resilient life for them. Yeah, so I think uh, at the beginning of this, a very funny anecdote about writing this piece is that it took a couple like a week and a half two weeks to edit and get into print and at the time I thought oh no what if this is not a relevant story when it comes out here we are <laughs> the pandemic will be over by then yeah exactly <laughs> so many so many months later here we are but um I'm very I'm very glad I wrote it at the beginning because I think it's still applicable to people's lives especially as we go into a new school year and people don't know what is going to be served up to them um, or are coping with the very bad situation they've been given or what have you. Um, what I said is that we are all parenting in crisis right now. And so many things changed so drastically, so quickly. Um, and on top of that, a lot of people's coping mechanisms have been degraded or taken away entirely. I mean, for me, I'm an extrovert. And so my coping mechanism is to go out in the world and get fed energy by my friends and have fun. And uh, being cut off from that was, is part of what everyone's dealing with. Certain things that you used to do to make you feel better, you don't have those anymore. So I think it's it's really taking a toll, no matter how good your practical circumstances may be. Um, But that being said, uh, you can always sort of calibrate how you approach a situation. Uh, And it actually, helps to do that in the in the early days after I lost Jake um I did a a, a eulogy of sorts for him not at a funeral but at a a different memorial service and um I spoke uh sort of off the cuff for a a while I think it's on YouTube too um about what I wanted my life to look like and the reason that I did that is because I was very afraid that I would live scared because a terrible thing had happened to me Um, And I was very afraid that because my life looked like a sad Lifetime movie, that I would make other people sad uh, and my kids would make other people sad. And that, 
I did not want that for our lives. As I said, as I mentioned, I want to be around people. I want to uh, have good times with people. I, I get a lot of joy out of making other people laugh and, and being positive. And so I, I was like, I don't want this life circumstance to change how the world approaches me in that way. And so I said out loud, moving forward, we will not be afraid because one thing happened on one day. I will not shelter my children from taking risks because of this. Uh, and I'm asking all of you not to look at my family like a sad trombone. Like we are, we are not womp womp. <laughs> we are going to be vibrant people. Uh, we're going to live the way that Jake lived and live fast and fun and, and, and have good times. And, and so, uh, saying those things out loud, I think changed the way I lived my life because I had asked people to help me and I had put myself out there to be held accountable uh, for this, the way I was gonna parent my kids. And at the very beginning of the pandemic, I saw a lot of parents and people in general, but parents specifically, well, I'm not a homeschool mom. I'm not a this mom. I'm not a that mom. I'm not a that dad. I'm not a stay at home dad. I don't do that. Um, and the quickest way to short circuit your success is to tell yourself that you are not that thing. Yeah. You're and that thing you've now. Already, yeah. Yeah. You've already written the ticket. Like it's, that's, that's bad news. So don't start with that. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I encourage people to say, to tell themselves not, you're not going to be a perfect homeschool mom, but you know what you can do? You can get up in the morning and read with your kid for 10 minutes. Right. And like those tiny things add up throughout the day. And particularly if you do, if you do one of the, the little things in the beginning of the day, it builds momentum for the rest of your day. Now, I'm not exactly the right teacher for this because there are plenty of days when I feel like, oh, I had zero momentum and did none of the small things. <laughs> but the principle remains the same because you can always start the next day and you don't have to be the parent you were in April. You, in fact, life requires that you be different now. Right. Um, and so it sort of messed with everybody's identity about how their parenting worked. And that's a real thing you have to deal with. This is what happened to me. It's like, suddenly I was not a working mom who could do all the things with a partner who was, you know, I, it was a very different life being a single mom, working full time, walking through the grief. Uh, and I had to wrap my brain around that. Uh, so there was a sort of a daily practice of trying to do that. But you very quickly told yourself, this is who I am now. And this is how I'm going to move forward. And, and yes, I think that's brilliant. And, and frankly, I know when everything began, I've gone through many phases since March. I was in the beginning like, oh my God, this is gonna be kind of cool. We have so much, I've been traveling so much. I can't believe I'm gonna be home for the next several weeks. Um, turning to my husband, like we're gonna get a ton of home projects completed, you know? <laughs> and at the beginning, we knocked a couple things off. And then I went into like, we're gonna do theme dinners. And I pulled out all our China and I made my husband wear a suit on like a Tuesday night. And I took pictures and I'm posting, I'm like, this is so fun. And, you know, then I went into this place where I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to go on for a while. I don't know what is going to happen with business. I don't know what's going to happen with my kid's school. You know, my kids are starting to get my kids were not happy. They were, right. they were like, wait, we're not going back to school. This is, they were devastated, oh, you know? And yeah. so it's dealing with their emotional well-being, and, you know, this idea of, can I have my friends over? They'll sit six feet apart outside. And am I the bad parent? If I let that happen, am I the bad I parent that I, that I, I'm not letting my kid, well, the other kids are doing it. So it was this it was this idea of every day I was faced with a new challenge and right. How was I going to handle that? And again, it was what type of parent am I going to be today? And mm -hmm. it's it's very much evolved and changed. And sometimes it goes backwards to where I was. But I but I love that. And I love that you put um, at the end, and I, I touched on this, but the end of this article is so beautiful. And really, I mean, you could write a whole book on just this article, and you should. I'm just putting that out there. But, Thank you, um, but you say perspective is one of the paradoxical gifts of tragedy. And I couldn't agree with that more. The things that seemed like crises in 2014 snapped into proper focus for me in 2015. 
just as the minor things I worried about before COVID-19 seem less significant with every passing day. I'm thankful for every tomorrow I get to try again, especially for my kids, having learned how easily tomorrow can disappear. And I love this, and, and I remember you wearing this necklace. You say, my grandmother was a member of the U.S. Women's Naval Reserve during World War II. After the war, she married her childhood sweetheart and had three kids, moving across the country when the world was de- when the world and the world when he was deployed. She too was eventually widowed, and she too went on to raise a happy family. After Jake died, I wore the Army Corps Army Air Corps locket my grandfather had given to her as a reminder that I could do the same. I mean, yeah. that's a way with words. <laughs> well, you, she was. You got to know that. Thank you. Uh, she was a she was a heck of a lady, so she she inspires that. Um, but yes, they had this little sweetheart necklace, 1940s sweetheart necklace that has both their pictures in it. Um, and she did go through. First of all, she lived a tough life in general and took on so many challenges uh, in the in the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, as sometimes on her own while he was deployed. Uh, they're just amazing. Um, but then she did go through tragedy, and she has three kids, one of whom is my mom, one of the most positive people on earth. Uh, and, and my grandmother was the same. So she, and she remarried and she remarried happily and they had a wonderful 20, 25 years together. Um, and so she was an, an inspiration to me as I walked forward because I knew that you could put that life together. Yeah. I knew that even though sometimes you don't want to even think about there being a next chapter, because again, is it a betrayal? Is it wrong? Um, that there, there could be, and I wanted to believe that there could be. Um, and people are different. Sometimes you, sometimes you like, you need to shut yourself off from that for a while and be in the dark place. Uh, but for me, I liked seeing a real, like a very close example of that displayed in my own life. Um, and as far as raising kids in the in the pandemic, I will say, and you've experienced this with lots of lots of things in y'all's life. Um, I think your kids react to stressful and even tragic situations using you as a cue. And so you don't want to shield them from it entirely. They need to experience it and they're going to see mom go through some stuff. And my kids saw mom go through some stuff, right? Yeah. And so I was not, I didn't try to hide everything from them, but I did try to be very clear that I'm a steady force in your life and you are safe and we're going to get through this um, instead of amping up their anxiety level to where mine might be. Right. <laughs> I tried, really tried to avoid that. And I think it, it's a hard balance to strike and it's, it's one that people are working with during this crisis. But I will say you can be a cue for your kids and you can give them a model for how to move through their days. Uh, even if you're feeling really anxious, which I sometimes am, you can put on that face for them a little bit and it will help both sides to some extent. Yes. And your, your children definitely are take cues from you. I see it today. <laughs> my, my, my kids will do something and I'm like, Oh my God. And I'm like, Oh my God, they totally got that for me. I'm like, Oh, yes. you know, yes. those are the moments where I'm like, Ryan, come on. Um, yeah. So let's talk about, you talk, you, you touched on that next chapter and, um, and you're in that next chapter. You, um, you met a wonderful guy, um, named Steve, who is incredible. And, um, you guys just got married and we did. <laughs> it was a, and that leads into, um, where I was days before the country shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, that week was, uh, leading into the first week of March and, you know, you're starting to hear coronavirus, things may shut down. Right. I'm, I'm texting with you, like, is this happening? You're like, it's, we're doing this. The <laughs> wedding was in Aruba and my husband and I decided like 24 hours. What day was, what day was the actual wedding? It was March. It, March 7th. March 7th. So yes. my husband and I decide like 24 hours before he's like, Hey, I think it's irresponsible for us both to go to Aruba. He's like, I don't Fair know. Enough. He's, you know, he's like, I'm hearing a ton of stuff. I'll stay back just in case, like, you know, 
everything hits the fan and at least someone's with the kids. I'm like, okay, understood. And so we go to Aruba and um, it was beautiful. And I'll, and I'll touch on, I am not a overly emotional person. In fact, people, you know, I, I get called the ice queen. They're like, you never show emotion. And and <laughs> and my husband says, well, that's a bunch of BS because she cries all the time in front of me. I got to deal with this all the time. <laughs> yeah, but, but I don't. I don't show a lot of emotion outwardly. It's yeah. just for me, it's like uncomfortable. And so I'd rather not show my emotions. And um, I'll never forget when you walk down the aisle. Well, first, your girls walk down the aisle and just seeing them and seeing them look at Steve. Um, and seeing the love in his eyes that he clearly had for them and that they had for him. And then watching you come down the aisle, you were so beautiful coming down that aisle. And I saw you walking towards Steve and like the whole last, like, I mean, gosh, the last 13 years since I met you, like flash forward in like flash before my eyes. And it was almost it seems surreal that I was standing there watching you walk the aisle to, to Steve. And, um, and I just started crying. And I mean, it was one of those involuntary and those happen every once in a while, like (laughs) once in a very blue moon, I get the involuntary involuntary tears and they just start coming out of my eyes. And my dad is standing next to me and he's like, you're crying And because he knows how, awkward it makes me feel to cry and I was like yeah that's where I am I'm crying I can't believe this you know but but it was so beautiful and um and again Steve's such an incredible guy but I do I do think I tell some people um I tell people sometimes I don't I don't get super sad uh very often anymore about what has happened or losing Jake but I get um I get very emotional about the enormity of what has happened in a very short period of time. And yeah. so I think that's, that's speaks to what you felt when I came down the aisle, cause like, we've gone through a lot together and, um, and just thinking about the evolution from just five years ago or just 10 years ago is pretty crazy, especially when you see our children growing, you know, there's just, there's so much there. Um, and I was very lucky. Uh, so in the grieving process, you don't, some people want to, uh, date immediately or just put themselves out there to kind of feel like, okay, I'm, I'm a real human who does things like this. I had a baby <laughs> and then raised both the babies. I didn't even think about that. I had blinders on for at least two years. And right around that time, uh, my neighbor, who is a seal wife uh, in my old house, in my old neighborhood where, where we, had just, we had just moved into this house with Jake five months before he died, and that house really became my house and the girls in my house that we put our lives back together in. And this neighbor that I had barely met uh, before Jake died, she walked across the street and I call it, so she's like crossed the gulf between us because grief will put a gulf between you and other people who aren't going through the same thing. But she understood and she walked across the street and she was like, whatever you need, come to me. And I don't care if what you need is a shot of tequila because that baby is plenty cooked and you'll be fine. <laughs> and Whatever then she said, then she said, I'm a seal wife. I've seen everything. You will not scare me. And I was like, the tequila thing was nice to hear too, but <laughs> I didn't take her up on it. But the, I'm not scared of you was really important to me. Yeah. Um, having people around you who know a little bit about how to deal with that, who are not scared of being near you who, look, I get it. When someone dies, especially young, it's reminding everyone of what they have to lose. And it feels bad. (laughs) It's not necessarily something you want to be near. So having her there and having her tell me that was really important. Um, And we've been friends ever since. And fast forward a little over two years, she was like, there's this guy I work with, I feel like you should meet. And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and she's like he's uh he's really regimented he's kind of a pain in the ass uh I was like you're not selling it that well yeah uh she's like he's also smoking so you should just like meet him for that reason and I said okay now you're speaking my language so <laughs> <laughs> so I did meet him um at a at a barbecue and uh and as soon as I met him I was like 
Ugh, I'm gonna like him. <laughs> you do right away. <laughs> because, well, he, he's from near my hometown. I could read it all over him. Uh, he's a smart ass. He gives me a hard time. All the things um, that I enjoy. So <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh dear. But there's so much in that thought when you're when you're moving on from something like this, because again, there's all the complicated feelings like I've talked about, and like I was raising my kids, and I don't know. There's so much involved in dating, and does it work or doesn't it work? And my life is very simple when I'm raising my kids, and maybe I'll just do that. Um, but I'm very glad that I took a chance on it. Um, by the way, I think he, I think the pitch to both of us was to him and to me was, I know somebody I think you can handle. <laughs> I mean, I think that's where we are, right? Like, I, I like that. I know someone you, th I think yeah. you can. And handle. I was like, yeah. both of us were sort of like, not sure what that means, but okay. So, uh, he did step into the picture and I have to say to the, he's a very, uh, an extremely secure man. Uh, in himself and his abilities and that helps with when there's a legacy and then there's a new chapter um you got to have somebody who's like that um he's also very secure in taking on giant challenges such as i don't know an instant family yeah <laughs> that's that's locked down in a house 24 7 during a pandemic oh yeah um, so you get back you you marry and get back and it's like we're married and now we're in lockdown Yes. And here's your two new daughters with and, your two children. Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. Crazy. Uh, yeah. It was. It was very. It was like the um, really boot camp of marriage. Yeah. Like we're gonna get a lot done in a very <laughs> intense short period of time. Um, but with the kids, uh, you know, I think he weighed that in his mind while we were dating. This is a very real responsibility. And the fir the first thing he tried on the dad front, it's very Steve, was the hardest thing you can do. He took us to Disney World. I remember that. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, like, they're only a couple months in. This is very promising, but are I you actually, sure you want to do this? I remember <laughs> you saying, we're going to Disney World with Steve. And I'm like, really? Oh, my gosh. I, I forgot about that until now. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it, it's a very Steve move to be like, what is the highest level dadding that I can attempt and I'm just going to jump in there. Right. Um, <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Oh my gosh. So he's very, he's very game for that. Uh, and he's a, he's a really solid force for the girls. And I love having a partner to do this with. It really, it changed my life. And it's, <laughs> it's so much fun. Um, even when we're 24 hours a day locked down in a pandemic. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think he, you, you touched on, he's very secure and strong. And he is because, you know, it's, he's, He's stepping in to fill the role that had Jake not passed, he would not have the opportunity for that role. Right. And um, I give tremendous credit um, to the men that have stepped up to many of my friends who have been yeah. widowed. And, um, you know, uh, Steve is, uh, like I said, he's an in incredible guy. Um, and important to note that he didn't just step into the, shoes um and play the role of um i'm going to date this widow right. she's got two kids oh by the way she is a political commentator who is very well known and so right. that was that was a bit extra you know and and i'd love to talk a little bit because one of the things that i love most about you is your I don't know how to best describe it. Your snarky wit, would that be a good way to describe <laughs> it? Um, you are, uh, you're a political commentator for CNN. You used to work for Fox. Um, and you frankly go to work every day and yeah. know that no matter what you say, there are going to be people that don't line up with it. And you, you know, your whole book's about how we can't have civil discussion anymore and, and, yes. <laughs> and share things with each other that we may not agree with. But, you know, the way the world works today, you say something and someone doesn't agree with it. Um, for you in particular, it's not just, oh, uh, you know, I don't like what she's saying. It's, oh, I'm going to attack her on Twitter. I'm going to call her a terrible mother. I'm going to say things yeah. about her dead husband. I've seen some of the craziest things. And... 
the way you respond to them is <laughs> masterful. And I'd love to talk about how that, the role that that plays in your life. And frankly, you know, how you overcome that idea that, that knowing every day when you wake up to go to work, you know, you're going to piss people off. I, I don't know, yeah. for better lack of a, a sense. No, it's true. Um, well, first of all, when Guy and I, Guy Benson and I wrote End of Discussion, I wish we had not been able to tell the future quite so well <laughs> because things have gotten, I mean, it's an increasingly re relevant subject, yeah. uh, let's say, about the inability to have uh, even sort of just mainstream political views uh, communicated on a regular basis if you're in a certain place or you're with a certain group of people, or if you're just do it at the wrong time at the wrong place on the wrong Facebook page, boom, your life can blow up on you. So it's, it's a, it's a weird time for that. Um, I would say I have been a contrarian or I've been the ideological weirdo my entire life. I grew up in a very liberal town and I'm a right of center libertarian uh, person. And so and this is one of the reasons I, I love having debates and I love as much free speech as possible is because it made me better at what I do. It made me a better thinker because people have always been testing what I believe. Uh, and we used to be able to have that back and forth without anybody getting really off the rails. Um, and it was so beneficial to my life that that's why I, I talk about it and write about it a lot. Um, but it, does, so I, th I feel like I'm well trained for this and I've been doing it for a long time. Um, one of the things I think it's sad about the way that things are degrading a bit is that you shouldn't have to be well trained your whole life and a professional to have these conversations. And if we can have a little more grace for people who aren't professional communicators uh, to communicate what they believe, I think that's good for all of us. But um, when it comes to trolling uh, or just mean people on the internet, that is a thing that unfortunately practice does make you better at. Uh, you don't want to have to take on all of that, but the more you get it, it's like, ugh, this doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't. Yeah. Um, and if you walk away from the social media that happens to be trolling you at the moment, it just disappears. Like you don't have to read it. Right. Uh, don't read the comments. It's very wise, wise commentary, but occasionally, a glass or two of wine in, I will read the comments and then I will start <laughs> dropping elbows on people. Um, just, I do think it serves a bit of a purpose. What One, it makes me feel better. And then people are like, ignore them, ignore them. And I'm like, sure. But also people should know that this is the stupid and disproportional price that you pay to be someone who speaks their mind in public. Like you shouldn't have to endure abuse of a late husband or of your you know, widowed motherhood in order to say you have a view on tax policy. It's so silly. And right. I think people who don't see that in their feeds don't realize that it happens a lot. <laughs> and so that's, that's one of the reasons for it. Probably not going to solve the problem, but I do like to occasionally mouth off at them. Um, but yeah, I think it, it can take a toll. Like I, I don't do nearly as much uh, Twitter as I used to for this reason because I realized I was using emotional research resources on people who were not my family and friends for whom I should be preserving my like patience and yeah. <laughs> kindness. Well, and, and I was always the one that when I saw somebody that would write something and you would have this like, again, masterfully witty response, <laughs> I would be the one tweeting like, how dare you, yeah. you know? <laughs> And then I read them and I'm like, oh my God, I should just like, I was that person like, don't you dare talk about her like that. Yeah, no, it's, no, people get, uh, understandably, I, I get more protective of my friends than I am of myself for sure. So I think we all have a tendency to do that. Um, but sometimes, yeah, I don't know. It, it is a, it is a very weird job and I will not say I'm certainly not conflict averse, uh, as you can see by my career choice. Um, I'm very comfortable having a disagreement with someone as long as it's an intellectual back and forth. It took me a long time to realize that not everyone is that comfortable with it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's people who are built for it and I happen to be one of them. Um, and so it took me a lot to realize that other people can be really uncomfortable in disagreement um, and sort of cushioning that for them helps um, or just communicating that like, hey, I, I enjoy this and I enjoy hearing what you have to tell me. Um, and I, I attempt to communicate that on TV as well. 
and also to communicate that like you have to laugh at some of this stuff sometimes i can't i cannot be a hundred percent in dire straits with my hair on fire or very sad about the state of whatever it is we're discussing all the time right uh i have a certain amount of perspective about twitter trolls and about every story of the news cycle because my life was put into very stark perspective at a certain point um and it's something that helped me in my career partly because um about four months after jake died which would be two months after my second was born i moderated a presidential debate yes you did a, a primary it was a gop primary presidential debate with nine candidates <laughs> and at the time i thought i got the email and i thought that's crazy i can't do that i like they asked me to do it and i said i should should i just ignore that i got that email i'll pretend that this never came across my desk but i mentioned it to guy benson and guy benson said no you absolutely are doing this and we're going to get you ready <laughs> and so i boot camped on that for a while but the important thing was that when I was scared of doing that and I, you know, my life is sort of in a shambles around me and I have a six week old baby and they're like, sure, come and do this thing. I thought, well, I mean, this already happened. Like how scary can nine dudes on the stage be like, just go out and do the thing. Right. <laughs> and so I think, I think that has, I got a giant heaping of helping of that in, in 2015 and it's sort of lasted me through 2020 we may be coming up on its expiration date at some point though <laughs> but 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 as of right now yeah and you did yeah. a great job in that debate i remember Thank that you. and i remember just looking at you up on the we watched it and i was just like i can't believe she's sitting here moderating a presidential debate right now this well is i think about the timeline and i think i was crazy i mean looking back on it i'm yeah. like i can't believe i did that <laughs> i'm so glad you did <laughs> what do you think about this idea you know I've been having conversations a lot with a lot of different people about really like the the title of your book, End of Discussion. There is yeah. no longer a place where you feel like you can come together and have discussion about things that you disagree on. And I want to know from you, do you think that's magnified by the 24-hour news cycle? Do you think that there's something that individuals sitting at home, I always like to say when I'm talking to someone, their area of expertise, like how can Joe Schmo, you know, I'm right. sitting at home, how can I start to have civil discussions with people that I don't line up with on, you know, right um, ideas? So, so number one thing, which is very unfortunate for this time, time that we're in at the moment, face-to-face -face is the best way to do it. <laughs> And so yeah, there because there is a certain amount of trust that has to be built between people to understand, like, especially these days, I'm not going to sell you out with some quote that you say to me in a, in a conversation we're having. There's a certain amount of trust that has to be there. But I, I do think real life conversations, even if they are Zoom or something with real people you have connections with is a way better way to do that. Um, than the amplified version that we sometimes do in public. Um, I would also say uh, the number one ground rule that we always give when I talk to college students about this is um, start start small, do a 20 minute conversation on a, on a subject that maybe you're not super, super emotional about with somebody who disagrees with you and take 20 minutes not to question their motives at all because the knee jerk, <laughs> reaction these days is to question the motives of the person sitting across from you. And it could just be that that person wants to get to the same end or help people in similar ways, but is taking a very different approach. And so if you can spend 20 minutes not questioning each other's motives, uh, then you're going to have a much better conversation. And frankly, that's most of the game because, <laughs> the, because like we do way too much of that right now. Um, the other thing is, and this, this goes with that, having a little grace for the person sitting across from you. If they, like for instance, have there been times when people say things to me about loss that are maybe not like perfectly calibrated? Sure, but I don't wanna scare everyone off from reaching out to me. Like, right. <laughs> so understanding that they're going through something too, they're trying to communicate. We all are different people who are just, if we can try, we can, 
work on understanding each other. Um, all of this sounds like the basics of human conversation, and yet we have lost a lot of that. <laughs> so, so I'm, you know, when I talk to college students, and I invariably have a great time talking to college students, I'm always worried, oh gosh, am I about to get canceled when I go into a college campus, which I'm about to do at Georgetown this semester to talk about free speech. I always have a better time I thought that, than I thought I would have, and everybody ends up being thoughtful and great, but you do have to lay that groundwork with like, I'm not out to get you, uh, how about you not be out to get me and we could toss some things around here. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, and I understand people's uh, reticence to jump into it um, because it, it feels scarier, I think, than it has in the past. And that's something I'm trying to work on in my own life and publicly. I love that, the, the idea of giving people grace. I think that is so important right now more than anything because I think right now there's a lot of people that are scared to talk about how they're feeling on a plethora of different topics because they're yeah. afraid if they say something wrong um you know they're they're just going to be chastised for it and and approaching yeah. with this and it's idea not fun. right and and you know yeah. you don't want to be afraid to say something so much that you just don't say anything at all and yes. if and we can approach with this idea of giving grace and knowing like you said, you're a professional. You do this for a living and you do it really well. But sometimes people may be trying to say the same exact thing that you're saying and it comes yes. out completely different. You know, well, they don't... And that, that's, a, that's initially why we wrote that book is because we felt like increasingly, I'm a public figure. I sort of take this on as part of my responsibility. And I understand that there's somebody watching every word I say um, who's sometimes explicitly just looking to tear it apart. So that's the life I've chosen <laughs> uh, for better or for worse, but it is not the life that everyone should have to live. Uh, and you, as a private citizen on your Facebook page, if you wanna say something, you shouldn't feel that it has to hit the same marks as if you were going on a national stage. I, I just, and people were paying consequences for that that were very real, that we thought, okay, well, this is really trickling down in a very bad way. Um, and it continues to do so. so um, you know, it's tough. I feel like, I feel like, uh, we're, we're always in having conversations now you're asked to know everything about the subject you're talking about without being allowed to explore it. And that is unsustainable. You can't come into a conversation with someone who's had a different experience from you and know everything about how you should address it without asking any questions. Like <laughs> you have to be able to throw some things back and forth. Yeah. And I think you are not just because you are my good friend, but you are an incredibly important voice right now. Um, Thank you. And, and one that I love listening to. And, um, and again, you know, no greater testament over the last couple months than this article you wrote in The Atlantic. Um, Thank you. Well, I hope it continues to be helpful as people go into the new school year. I, I actually, so I, I read, I reread it. I read it the day it came out. You sent it to me. I was like, oh my God, I needed that. And then I read it again this morning and I was like, I needed it more today than I did on April 8th. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> I mean, it's actually more important now than it was on April 8th because yeah. Yeah. now is when it's like the oh my gosh, we're in it for the long haul. You no, know? Now we're really changing. Yeah. yeah. Back then it was like, I guess we're going to change for a month. Yeah. It was like, okay, this is a good article. It's going to help me see me through the next few weeks. But now it's like, oh my gosh, like yes. this is this is one you can go back to and reflect on for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Catherine, I want to ask you one final question. It's a question that we ask to all our guests um, at the end of the Resilient Life podcast. And I'd like to know, what does living a resilient life look like for you? Living a resilient life to me looks like uh, praying, loving my family, and moving my feet. And that's basically it. <laughs> and that's perfect. Those and three things, the rest will fall into place eventually. Yes. And I think I, the moving your feet part, you know, again... I've talked so much about running the marathon and, and you put it into context. It's all about just moving your feet. And we actually took that idea and said, okay, we're going to move our feet yeah, and we're going to just make it literal. Yes. <laughs> I love it. 
Mary Catherine, <laughs> always great talking to you. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible conversation. And um, I know that a lot of people out there who are going through challenging times, who are dealing with adversity. And, and I said, as we entered into this pandemic, all of a sudden, all of our worlds look different. All of a sudden, yep. our, our, our dinner table looked different for each and every one of us. And so um, your voice and your words are more important now than ever. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just hope they are helpful. Mary Catherine, as always, it's so great to talk to you. Your thoughts on parenting amidst tragedy, uncertainty um, is so helpful. Like I said, now more than ever, where we are living in a unknown world and um, it's super important. So I appreciate your words and your insight. Uh, I want to remind everyone to tell your friends about the Resilient Life podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And check me out on Instagram at at rmannion. Until next time on The Resilient Life, I'm your host, Ryan Mannion. Thanks, everyone.